pile. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> <Got it. Thanks. coughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Sage Weil. Um, my throat's beginning to act up, so I apologize in advance if I start to lose my voice. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that I've been working on Ceph for um, almost 10 years now. Um, usually when I give talks at conferences, I tend to give sort of a high-level overview of what Ceph does, how the architecture works, the various ways that you can use it. Today I'm going to try something a little bit different, and I'm going to talk um, specifically about the object storage layer in Ceph called Rados, and how you can write applications that talk directly to that storage layer. Um, so I'm going to begin by setting the stage a little bit um, and try to motivate things by giving a, a sob story about someone trying to scale out a really simple web application and dealing with the storage part of that. Um, I'll very briefly talk about what Ceph is, what some basic um, features of the architecture are. Um, and then I'll shift to looking at um, Liberata specifically, the interface it used to talk directly to the internal object storage layer, um, all the various crazy things it can do. Um, and I'll try to finish up with a, an email use case that sort of demonstrates how you might build um, an application that's designed specifically to use that storage backend. Uh, feel free to interrupt me anyway, anytime um, and ask questions. Um, so imagine you're, you're still in college, you're living in a dorm room, and you decide to write some simple web application. You know, maybe you're um, scouring image off, images off the web and overlaying cute um, quotes on top of them, something like that. But you have, you have a single server, you're writing a bunch of files to the directory, maybe they're JPEG, something like that. Life is simple, um, primarily because you don't have any users. Um, you send an email to the Canvas email list, suddenly you have some users, so you move over this, everything over to some dedicated servers, maybe you get some, something from the planet, something like that, um, and you realize that you have to centralize your storage, so you have a number of web front ends and everything's NFS mounting some file server. You know, maybe it's just a Linux box, maybe it's a NetApp, whatever, but life is pretty simple, you don't have to change your application at all. Um, your site begins to grow, people actually start to use it, and you realize you have to scale up. So usually this means you buy a bigger, more expensive file server um, from some name brand vendor, um, max out your credit cards, <clears throat> that works for a while. Um, but at some point you realize that um, the, the cost of these appliances tends to be nonlinear in the amount of um, work you can actually get them to do. Um, and solution, eventually you realize that you need to scale out. So the usual approach is to hash the, the name of the file content or the file name or something like that and use that to distribute across some number of servers. Um, so you hash the content, hash modulo the number of servers, um, mount a whole bunch of them behind things. Everything's, everything's fine. Your site continues to grow. Um, until you start to deal with sort of the various problems that handle just by having to manage all these machines. So your file servers start to fill up, your directories get really big, that might be a problem just for administrators who do ls-l, it might be that um, the file systems that they're running don't handle large directories, although that tends not to be a case these days. Um, so the usual approach here is that instead of hashing across file servers, you hash across a bunch of shards, we'll call them, smaller directories, and you have lots of these shards stored on each server, which means that when you add new um, backend storage servers, you can sort of migrate these chunks of your data set independently um, to other, other machines. Probably you're using some combination of rsync and SCP. Maybe you're doing some trickery to try to maintain a consistent view of things, even though your web application is live and it's reading and writing data. Uh, maybe you just take it down for a few minutes and hope that nobody notices. That's usually actually what happens. Um, but in the end, um, you realize that it's actually 2014 and not 2004. You're eventually, essentially reinventing the wheel yet again. Um, you're doing sort of this, re-implementing this ad hoc sharding approach where you have to break your data set into pieces and distribute those across servers, um, balance that load across lots of servers. And we haven't even started to look at the issues of um, reliability, whether those servers actually fail and whether you need to replicate across them and so forth. Um, but really, we want to avoid having to reinvent the wheel. Um, and so in particular, if you're the person who's writing this web application, you don't want to have to think about any of these details. What you really want is some sort of distributed, magical distributed storage system that's going to sit behind your web application and it's going to deal with all these nitty gritty, dirty details of scaling things, um, sharding your data across multiple servers, rebalancing when you add new servers, um, replicating, migrating, healing when there are failures, all that good stuff. And in, 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 re in exchange for that, usually you're willing to give up some flexibility. So even though you're writing to a file system, you don't need to rename files, you don't need hierarchical directories, you're actually probably fine with the flat or flattish namespace. And life would be much simpler if you took this approach. Now, Turns out it is 2014, and there are a number of different solutions that'll sort of fit this bill. Um, today I'm going to talk about Ceph, because that's the one I know all about. Uh, but there are others. I'll, I'll review some of those um, towards the end. Um, so at a very high level, Ceph is a distributed source system. Um, we say it's distributed because it's designed to scale out to um, a very large scale, so tens of servers to tens of thousands of servers, terabytes to exabytes, um, so very large. Um, it's designed from the ground up to be fault tolerant, so there's no single point of failure, and you can deploy it on commodity components that may or may not be 
very reliable. Um, and it's designed to be self-managing and self-healing so that when you know, disks fail and hosts go down and so forth, the administrator doesn't have to directly intervene. The system will sort of um, deal with that on its own without too much fuss. Um, some very basic architectural features. Um, <clears throat> Ceph is designed around um, a number of smart storage demons. Um, the basic motivation here being that um, centralized coordination of a large number of very dumb devices um, is a lot of work and doesn't tend to scale very well. Um, so Ceph takes sort of an alternative approach where we have a number of um, what we like to think are very smart devices um, or smart demons running on top of stupid devices. Um, and they use peer-to-peer -peer type pro protocols to coordinate and have some sort of emergent behavior that gives you the sort of strong consistency and replication and so forth that you want. I'm sorry, did you just say you're building Skynet? Yeah. <laughs> if only. <clears throat> Not yet. Um, so the other uh, key feature is that um, Ceph is built around a flexible placement algorithm called Crush. Um, the basic idea here is that um, the system has some awareness of the hardware infrastructure across, this, uh, across which it's deployed. So you have disks and hosts, hosts and racks, racks and rows. Um, and then you have a hash algorithm that's smart enough to distribute your data across that infrastructure based on some basic policies. So you might say that I want three replicas of every ob object, but I want them separated across, hack, um, across racks or maybe across data centers, um, whatever your policy might be. Um, and the system is smart enough to do that using a hash placement algorithm that will avoid a, a metadata server. Yes? So, so with that hashing, if you have a really hot um, shard, mm -hmm. can you intervene and see, tell it, look, I want to that one? Yeah, so the question is, what happens if you have a very hot shard? Can you intervene? Um, to the, the, the easy answer is that um, normally you don't have to because you're hash, hashing objects randomly across shards and then the shards across servers. And so your, your workload tends to be very distributed. If you had like one object that's extremely hot or you're very unlikely, unlucky, then you would have a problem. Um, and there are, there are certain instances where you can, you can tell the system to, to push load off a particular server if that happens. Um, so there are ways to sort of work around that if you need to. But in, in the general case, it's not necessary because things are sort of randomly sprayed across all your servers. Um, but the last thing, um, and perhaps the most significant sort of design thing, at least from the object storage layer's perspective, is that there's no metadata server um, or proxy that is necessary for finding objects. So that the client library is smart enough to know what the topology of the cluster is and what this hashing algorithm is, and it can calculate and go directly to the server that has the data that it needs. Um, and so you get clients that have sort of massive parallel access to all serv storage servers, and they tend to be, have direct access without a lookup stage um, or some sort of proxy. Um, so at a very high level, um, Ceph is built around what we call Rados. This is a distributed object storage layer that's responsible for actually storing all the data in the system. This is the part that scales from tens of servers to tens of thousands of servers. It makes sure that all the data objects stored in the system are replicated across multiple nodes, that they're distributed properly, that when you add a rack of storage, things sort of balance out. When nodes fail, the things get replicated. All of those sort of details are handled by this distributed object storage layer. So from the perspective of somebody that's using it, um, aptly named Liberados, um, they can just say, write this object into the object store, and everything is sort of handled um, by the Rados um, distributed object storage layer. So Liberados is the client-side library that's used to access this um, distributed object store. I mean, you can bind it to applications in C and C++. It's just a shared library, and there are wrappers for various languages, whether it's Python or Erlang or PHP or whatever. Um, but on top of this sort of basic object storage service distributed highly reliable, highly available service. And we built a number of applications. So one of those is um, the Rados Gateway, which gives you a RESTful, a higher level RESTful object storage interface. And that's compatible with Amazon S3 and OpenStack Swift. Um, so think HTTP gets and puts, that sort of thing. Um, there's also the Rados Block Device, which is a, um, a shared, a virtual disk um, that's backed by objects across the, across the storage server, across the storage cluster. Um, and that's supported by modern Linux kernels and by KVM and Zen. So you can have virtual machines with their virtual disks backed by, backed by the storage cluster and that supports things like snapshots and so forth. Um, and finally, there's CephFS, which is a full-blown POSIX distributed file system that distributes all its data across the storage server. And the basic, the basic idea here is that because we've built this reliable and highly available object store, building these higher level services is much easier and because we don't have to worry about replication and data distribution and so forth. That's all pushed down into the lower levels. <coughs> and it turns out that in the beginning, Rados was actually pretty simple. There weren't that many things you could do with objects. You could just read and write them and it would distribute them and replicate them. But as we built these higher level services, we realized that there are certain capabilities that were really useful for building sort of coherent um, you know, snapshotable, highly consistent um, services that could be pushed down to the lower levels that would make all that work much better. Um, and the end result is something that 
we think is pretty interesting, and um, I like to think that would be useful for other applications um, that need sort of scale out storage. Um, so what is Libretos then? Um, Libretos is a native library for accessing this distributed object store, Rados. Um, it's just a shared library with bindings in all these different languages. Um, it gives you, again, a direct data path to all the storage nodes. So it speaks the, the native Ceph protocol on the back end, and the, the client node talks directly to the storage server that has the data that it needs. And it hides all the details of data distribution, migration, replication, and node failure. The, your application doesn't have to worry about any of that. That's all handled behind the scenes. Um, so at the core of all this is the, the basic data model that we support. So you're storing objects. Um, object is sort of a, a lumpy unit of data um, that has some name that you can choose. You know, it can be foo, some string of digits. Um, there's some data associated with that object. Um, that's an opaque byte array, so it looks sort of like a file. Um, it can be anywhere from bytes to gigabytes, and you have byte granularity access to that. So you can truncate it, you can override a random extent to it, you can append to it. Um, all, those, all those sorts of things that you can do with files, you can do with objects. Um, objects also have attributes associated with them. So these are um, small key value pairs, things like version equals 12. Um, the way that they're stored, it's intended, they're intended to be very small, it's optimized for that case. So you can make them big, but it won't work very well. Um, but the, the last and probably more unusual thing is that you can also store key value data inside an object. Um, so that gives you sort of random access, insertion, removal, and listing, kind of like you'd get with a NoSQL type of, um, of product or like a Berkeley DB file. And the keys can be you know, some number of bytes long, and the, the values can be anywhere from bytes to kilobytes and maybe even megabytes. Um, a little bit more about that later. Um, objects exist in a cluster inside of an abstraction called a pool, which is just a logical collection of, of lots of objects um, within a sort of a separate independent namespace. Um, you can name your pools whatever you want. Um, but the main thing is that pools have some basic properties associated with them. That's the, the replication and data placement policy. So you might say that this particular pool has three replicas and it's distributed across different racks in my cluster. This other pool only has two replicas. Um, distributed across these hosts. And maybe this other pool is um, stored using erasure coding, um, separated across hosts using this particular scheme or whatever. The erasure co coding isn't there yet. It's coming in the Firefire release, which is coming out in, in February. Um, so sort of getting down to the, the nitty gritty here, um, this is a simple um, hello world type program. So I'm going to use the C++ interface because that tends to be my language of choice, at least in user space. Um, so you, you'll include the header file, of course. You just install the package and so forth. Um, you would create a cluster handle that says, this is the, the Rados cluster I'm going to talk to. Indicate what user you're going to authenticate as and call the connect method. Behind the scenes, this is either going to um, look at the configuration file that's installed in NCSEF, or you can add some additional calls to specify which server you're going to connect to and so forth. And that'll, that'll go out, it'll authenticate, discover the topology of the cluster, and come back. Um, and then you create what we call an IO context, which is essentially sort of like a file handle that's associated with a particular pool. This is a thing that you use to do actual IO operations against the cluster. In this case, we're going to talk to a pool called my pool. Um, next, we'll create a buffer, put hello world in it, and call the, the write function to write to an object called my object, and we'll put that data in that object. Now, go out to the cluster, tell it to write. It'll get applied to all the replicas. We'll get an acknowledgment back when that's, that's safe and sound. Um, we can then go set an attribute on the object that sets what particular version it is. Yes? Can I just ask about that, that acknowledgement of the right? Yes. Can you set the policy for a quorum or you know, that you only have one or you have all? So the, the question is whether when you're doing a write, if you can um, get an acknowledgement when you have a quorum as opposed to all the replicas. And the, the short answer is no. Um, Ceph is very pedantic about making sure that everything, all replicas are consistent. And so you get all the acknowledgement back only when you get all the replicas. And that's because we don't want to deal with cases where you only wrote to two out of three, but then those two failed, and now you have an old version. And we want to be very careful that we actually know that the thing that you thought was written was actually written, and your code doesn't have to worry about the case where it actually wasn't. Um, there are other systems that are designed. When you can deal with those sorts of ambiguities, then you probably want a different type of system than Ceph. Um, so the next operation will just set an attribute on that object. Again, that'll go out and do it, reply. Okay. Um, and of course, you can read that data back. Um, you know, we can tell it to read from my object again into a different buffer, some number of bytes at offset zero, and we assert that it, we actually got the right data back. So nothing too, too crazy here. This interface probably looks pretty similar to any other sort of storage interface that you would use in any other environment. Um, so the, the first thing that sort of distinguishes Libretus from other systems that makes it interesting, I think, is the idea of having object transactions. And this is basically the ability to group a number of operations on a single object into a single request that's shipped out to the cluster and applied atomically to that object. Um, 
<coughs> and ensures that that um, entire transaction is implied, applied exactly once. Um, so as a simple example of this, we can rewrite our hello world example as an atomic creation transaction. So we pair all our buffers, and we're going to write hello world and set this attribute. Um, we declare, declare this object write operation structure, which is essentially a description of the transaction that we're going to apply. And we simply call methods to sort of build up that transaction memory, all the different operations that we're going to do. So first, there's going to be an exclusive creation that'll succeed if there's no object and create it. If the object already exists, it'll error out within the exist. Um, then we'll write all the data and then set the attribute. And finally, we call the operate method, which actually says, OK, take this transaction, submit it to the cluster, and actually apply it. And that'll either succeed in its entirety or it will fail. Um, so that's all well and good. Um, but it turns out there's, there's more you can do here. You can also have transactions that are conditional. So you'll notice that um, that create event would abort if the object already exists. So you can actually have steps in your transaction um, that if they fail, they'll make the whole thing abort. So typically, um, the strategy here is to create guard operations um, early on that assert that some condition is true. For example, they might verify that an extended attribute has a particular value, that the object version is some particular version, something like that. And that means that you can do um, the equivalent of atomic compare and swap operations from the client's perspective um, that are enforced by the storage system. So you can have lots of clients in your system coordinating implicitly via the storage system without having to have sort of some sort of locking or coordination layer that you build yourself on top of things. Um, so, again, moving on from our Hello World example, say instead of saying world, we actually wanted to say Perth. Um, and so we can prepare a transaction that has the new data that we're going to store in the object, um, the expected old by the attribute, and the new attribute, and prepare a transaction that the very first step, it asserts that the, the version attribute that's already on the object has a specific value. That's what we expect, the one that we set before. And assuming that's true, then the transaction will continue. We'll replace the data with some new content and set the version to version 2. And when you submit this to the cluster, it'll go, it'll do that validation. If it's true, it'll apply the transaction to all replicas and then return to you. Um, so the nice thing here is that you could have um, a similar transaction that's being sent from every other city in the, in the country um, trying to choose a different city. Um, and only one of these is actually going to succeed because only one of them is going to be the first one there and it's going to change from version one to version two. Uh, so the second interesting thing that you can do with Libratus um, that's a bit unusual is that these objects can store not just byte data like a file, but they can also store key and value data. So each object um, can store this key value data that's completely independent of the file data. So you can actually have an object that has all these different types of data stored, sort of encapsulated within that logical unit. And the main thing with the key value stuff is that it um, gives you random access, insertion, deletion, and range query. So key value, you have a table of names and inodes or whatever you want to store there. Uh, so this is really good for structured data. And we use this um, internally with a number of other SEP services. So for example, the Rados Gateway, which was, is providing this S3-like, Swift-like, um, higher level RESTful interface, um, has to maintain an index on the user buckets that indicate what um, objects exist in that bucket so that you can go back and you can list them later. And so we store all that index data in a key value object. Um, and so when you're actually creating a new object, you just send an operation that says insert this new value into the index, and the client side doesn't have to know how big the index was or what offset to write to, any of that stuff. The storage system sort of manages all the, that little level detail for you. Uh, similarly, the, the Ceph distributed file system uses these key value objects to store directories. So essentially, it's just a map of file names to inodes. And so when you do file creations or inode updates or whatever, it doesn't have to do an expensive sort of read, modify, write operation to maintain some special format for the directory data. All that's handled by the low level um, storage library on the storage servers and the, the client doesn't have to worry about it. Uh, the third unusual or interesting thing that, that Libratus does is gives you um, sort of a very powerful, um, although somewhat difficult to use, um, infrastructure to support snapshots. Um, so the snapshots in Ceph can be either at sort of a high coarse pool granularity, or they can actually be as, as narrow as an individual object granularity. And the motivation here is that we want to support um, snapshots on smaller pieces of data um, in the system. So for example, for the Redis block device, um, you have a number of disk images. Um, RBD allows you to create snapshots on a per image basis, and that applies only to the objects that are storing data for that particular data storage, that disk image. Uh, similarly, for the Ceph file system, it has the ability to create snapshots for any directory or subdirectory in the system, and we, we use this capability to apply only to the objects that are storing file data for files contained within those directories. So the, the, the cost is that there's some coordination with the cloud client code that's required to make sure that um, you're sort of keeping track of which snapshots apply to which objects, and that has to get fed back into the cluster when you're doing writes. 
Um, but the flip side of that is that it allows for point in time consistency from the perspective of the client. So in contrast to snapshot solutions that are based on NFS servers, where it's the server that's actually doing the snapshot, and things like um, asynchronous client write back from their caches isn't sort of coherent from the snapshot's perspective. Um, in Seth's case, we can actually apply that serialization point on the client side um, and have a sort of stronger consistency semantic. And of course, it goes without saying that all this is copy on write, so that snapshots don't actually consume any space on disk until you actually modify data that was snapshotted. And at that point, you have to maintain two copies. Um, the fourth thing, and one of the most exciting, I think, is the ability to implement new classes in Rados. Um, so if you think of things in sort of the high-level um, object-oriented sense where you have some piece of data and you have another number of methods that manipulate that data, um, you can think of Rados as implementing some very basic methods like read and write extent, set attribute, delete, things like that. Um, Rados classes allow you to implement new code, um, new object methods that are based on the existing functionality, um, compile that code and actually embed it into the storage system and execute it there. Um, so there's sort of a simple plugin API that lets you write these new methods. The admin will build it into a shared object and deploy it on all your object servers. Um, and then the clients can invoke that code um, using the Rados API. So this sort of comes in two flavors. You can have read side methods that will um, you know, send a request method invocation off to the storage cluster. They'll do some processing and return the result. Um, and then there's the write side methods where you, you send a request. It'll maybe do a read, modify, write, do some computation validation, generate a transaction that can consistently and safely apply to all the replicas on that object. Um, so, a simple example of a class method you might implement. Um, this one computes an MD5 sum on the object contents. Um, so there's, you know, this is a simple C method that you implement. There's this context argument that you can mostly ignore. It's used for internal tracking. Uh, the important thing here is that there's a buffer that's being passed into your function, and there's a buffer that's being passed out of it. So this is the data that, effectively, the arguments that are being passed from the client. Um, and this is the return value, the return data that's being returned for the read side methods. Um, so in this case, we, we stat the object, figure out how big it is. If the, if the object doesn't exist or we get an error, we just return immediately. Um, we read all the data for the object into some in-memory buffer. Um, and then we call the MD5 library to calculate the digest, which is you know, 128 bits of gibberish. Append that to the output buffer that's going to be passed back to the client, and then return success. And in order to invoke this from some client code um, on the other side of the network, um, <coughs> We'll make this example a little bit more interesting by doing a compound operation where we're actually going to be performing multiple read operations in the same sort of single request. So we declare an object read operation, just sort of a compound transaction. Um, first, we're going to stat the object, figure out how big it is, what its modification time is. And then we're going to invoke the class method ComputeMD5, which we just looked at, which is part of my class.so, whatever, which is deployed to your servers. Um, and we're going, to pass in, we're going to pass in no data because it has no arguments. Oops and the return result is going to be passed back in the out buffer. Yes? So all of these custom classes only need to be deployed on the OSDs, on these servers, right. so there's nothing that has to happen on the client for that work. Exactly. Yes. Yes. And it's the administrator's job to make sure that actually happens. Um, so and then you know, we, we call the operate method, which gives the transaction to the library. It goes and performs both of these operations and comes back and returns. And at that point, we can assert that we either got an error or we actually got you know, 128 bits of stuff back and printed out. Um, so this is a pretty simple example, but you can imagine there are a lot of different possibilities of things that you can do with this. So um, sort of going back to our motivating example from storing images in the storage cluster, where each, each object is a big JPEG or something, you can imagine a class that's actually doing image manipulation. It might be rotating an image and rewriting it. It might be generating thumbnails and returning it. It could be applying some filter to it. Um, you can imagine if you're, you're streaming out structured data in some log type format, um, you could have a class that is going through and filtering the records and looking for some matching pattern and only returning the results. So instead of shipping the haystack over the wire, you're only shipping the needle that you find. Um, the Rados block device and Rados gateway have their own classes that they use, uh, mostly to enforce sort of a clean interface to the objects that are storing metadata about disk images and so forth, so they can do argument validation and make sure you're not storing gibberish in the system. Um, and one of the more interesting examples to come along is a, is a class contributed by a, a contributor, Noah Watkins, that takes the Lua um, embedded script interpreter. Lua is a simple scripting language that uh, is sort of designed to be very easy to embed in other applications and shoves it in a Rados class. And so you can actually, on the client side, write a bunch of scripting code, send a request off to the storage server, and it'll run it in Lua and read and write stuff, do whatever you want, and then ship the result back. So sort of a... Um, probably raises a lot of red flags for people who are worried about security, but 
also <laughs> introduces a number of interesting possibilities if you're running in a controlled environment and trying to do interesting things. So, um, so all that said, so as I said at the beginning, um, Redis began as a relatively simple object store. We were just storing blobs of data to store file data for a file system. Um, and as we developed these other services, the Redis block device and the Redis gateway, we realized that it was helpful to push some of this capability down into the storage layer. Um, for the sort of last bit, I'd like to look at sort of an example of a type of application um, that might be able to take advantage of some of this functionality to have sort of a scale-out storage backend that's hopefully a little bit more efficient and, and attractive than, than what the current solutions are. So one of my sort of pet peeves is the way that a lot of service providers deal with email. So it turns out that email hosting tends to be a pain in the, pain in the butt for a lot of hosting providers. Um, typical solutions tend to use tools like um, Postfix and Courier and Dubcot for IMAP and so forth. Um, but it turns out usually people are storing things in Mailder format, which um, is not the most efficient thing in the world. Um, they tend to use NFS file servers and it tends to hammer them very hard and performance tends to suck and it's expensive and file servers fail and it's not very, not very nice. Um, Mailder in particular is very inefficient, um, especially when you're trying to list um, the contents of a mailbox. It's essentially storing every uh, message in a separate file. And in order to, for example, to get your, your mailbox list, it has to open up every file and read the headers and get your, your from and your to and your subject so you can just list your mailbox. Um, um, on the other hand, Ceph is sort of an attractive backend from a high level because it already gives you sort of reliability, um, scalability, so you can just add servers as you need them. Um, everything's replicated. It has a simple consistency model, so you don't have to worry about these weird issues where things appear and then they disappear, that sort of thing. So the question is, could we make this work? Um, so the nice thing is that the, 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 the data model for email is relatively simple, right? So you have, you have messages that contain some sort of raw data, just a bunch of headers and a bunch of body. Um, so that clearly maps onto just the, the byte array that's associated with an object. So that's pretty straightforward. Sometimes messages have some MIME data structure associated with them. They have some structure. So it might be that you want to you know, index some of that and sort in attributes so that it's easy to access things later. Maybe that's a win, maybe not. I actually don't know enough about MIME to know if that's even a, a difficult problem. But clearly, you can easily map a mail message to an object. That's pretty simple. Um, you also have mailboxes, which are simply collections of lots of email messages. Um, so you have references in the mailbox to all the different email messages that it contains that would be very easy to store as keys and values in the mailbox object, um, referencing the, you know, the unique message ID for that particular email message. Um, mailboxes also have things like flags associated with messages, whether you've read or forwarded it, something like that. Um, one of the easy optimizations that you can do here is that um, usually um, things like IMAP will do a list objects or list messages and get back only the headers but not the message content. So you could usually just take all of the message headers associated with the messages and shove them in the mailbox as the value associated with those key value pairs. So a little bit of extra storage there, but when you list the contents of the message, it's all in one object, it's all in one place on disk, you can list the contents very quickly. Um, and of course, just to round things out, you have users in your mail system and they have mailboxes and so you'd have some object per user that maps to all the different mailboxes that they have and of course, mailboxes map to the messages. So relatively straightforward and it sort of conveniently maps onto both the, the data portion of objects and the key value capabilities that Redis provides. Um, so sort of a simple example, um, the first thing you wanna do here is actually deliver mail. So you have a message come in over SMTP, you generate some unique message ID, or maybe just use the one that's in the existing headers. Um, you write the message object, and sort of the last thing you need to do is add a reference to that message from the mailbox object. So you need to add a key value pair referencing the message, but you also need to update the message count for the mailbox so that you know that the size increased. And it turns out that you wanna do both of those things atomically so that things don't get out of whack. And so that's a perfect opportunity to use a Redis class. So you can invoke a, me invoke a method that says add message, and it would write the key, um, read the old size, increment it, and then write a new size all in some a nice convenient atomic transaction. So that's all well and good. Um, but what happens when you have an IMAP client that's open and it's idling and it's waiting for new coming, incoming messages? You, when you have that message come in over the wire, you wanna know that, you wanna make sure that the IMAP client gets notified that something has arrived. Um, so it turns out that Libredos also has a, a whiz -bang feature that we call watch notify. Um, so the basic idea here is that clients can establish an interest in an object, which we call a watch. So they send a request that says, I wanna subscribe to inf um, announcements essentially that come out over that object. And then clients can also send a notify message that's distributed to all watchers on that particular object. Um, so you can imagine in this email case, you might have a bunch of IMAP clients that have um, 
where the server process has um, that mailbox open. So they um, subscribe to watch notifications on those mailboxes. Um, and then when a message is delivered, or maybe when you delete a message from the mailbox, something like that, a notify request is sent that's distributed to all the current watchers. So that process gets notified that there's been a change. Um, they all acknowledge back that, that they actually processed that, and the person who sent the notify finds out that yes, everybody has heard that I made this change and things, things can continue. Um, so that would be kind of nice because I think currently IMAP servers, they'll sit there and pull on a mail dir looking in the new folder to see if there's been a change or they'll look at the directory in time or some, some kludgy thing that doesn't work over NFS. And all of those problems sort of go away when you have sort of a first level support in the object store for the, the, the capability that you really need. Um, so I've just told you that Liberatos can do everything under the sun. There are a lot of things that I actually can't do, so I want to sort of make it clear what, where it might be a good fit and where it might not be. Um, so Liberatus doesn't stripe large objects for you. So if you want to store a big one terabyte thing, um, you, you want to stripe that over lots of Liberatus objects and not store it in one big Liberatus object, because the Liberatus object is all stored on one sort of set of servers as one sort of unit. Um, and this is exactly what the Rados block device and the Rados gateway and the Ceph file system do. They stripe over lots of, lots of Rados objects. Uh, you can't rename objects. Um, that's sort of antithetical to the way that Rados works because um, it, it, it uses the object name to figure out which server it's going to be stored on. And so if you rename it, then you have some weird multi-server multi communication that doesn't work. Um, you can't do multi-object transactions. Um, so we're, we're not a database and we're not really trying to be. Um, so if you have two objects that are stored in the system that need to be updated in tandem, then you need to do the coordination about doing that in a safe way on your own. So usually people use a two-phase commit or an intent log, um, sort of tried and true strategies there. And that's exactly what the file system and Rados Gateway do. They have their own sort of mechanism for, for keeping things consistent. Um, Rados doesn't do secondary object in, um, indexes. <clears throat> so you can only find an object in the system based on its name. You can't send a, question, a query to the system that says, give me all objects that have attribute foo equals bar. It won't do anything like that, although there are other systems that do. So if that's a requirement, you can look at those. Um, and you can only list objects by pool in sort of a complete and coherent way. So you can, you can iterate all the objects in the system, but they're returned in hash order, which is generally not very useful. So if you need to enumerate the things that you've stored, you usually need to maintain your own sort of index that does that. So the Rados Gateway has the bucket index for that. The file system has directory objects, you know, depending on your, on your strategy. Yes? How expensive is that? Um, like, is that a, a conventional operation where a lot of people optimize for it? Or is it like most systems, they, they just don't allow you to even break the keys? Yeah. So, so the question is, how efficient is it? Um, it's not something that we optimize for at all. Um, that said, it's not inefficient. It's just um, inherently expensive because you're literally enumerating every object in the system. So you'll send a request and you'll get back the first thousand entries. And you send another request, you'll get the next thousand. And it'll do it. It's just, it just takes forever. It'll take days to iterate over a billion objects, right? So um, if you need it to be fast, you're probably doing it wrong. <laughs> another question. Can you do uh, wildcard searches for objects? The question is, can you do wildcard searches for objects? And the answer is, actually, you, you can. You can say list objects only with this prefix. Um, but at the same time, it's not efficient. So it'll, it'll actually list all objects, and it'll just only return the ones that match. So it's not that big a win. Yeah. Um, so just to put a little rarity sort of in, in perspective um, with respect to other object stores and other sort of scale out open source solutions. Um, Rados is a, a strongly consistent object store. So it's a, a CP system, sort of in the cap context. Um, it favors consistency over availability. Um, so there are a number of systems that sort of take different design positions within that overall space. Um, so Swift is probably the one that you're most familiar with. That's uh, part of OpenStack. Uh, it's a distributed object store. That's RESTful. Um, Swift is generally an AP system. Um, so it's typically last writer wins. Um, uses a, a RESTful API. Um, the data modeler model is much simpler. So you're storing big objects using a, a get or put, sort of an atomic thing. You can associate metadata with them, but you don't have sort of all this weird um, key value stuff that you can store inside of objects. Uh, GlusterFS is, um, I think you'd best describe it as a CP system, although I think it's sort of fuzzy, um, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and it's specifically a file-based model, so it looks like a file system. Everything is a file. Um, so your application has to be coded to store everything in a byte array. Um, so that may or may not be appropriate for your use cases. Sort of shifting to the other side of more of the database side of things, NoSQL world. Um, React is another AP system that um, sort of faithfully implements the Dynamo design that came out of Amazon a couple years back. Um, so that means when you have divergent replicas, you have 
flexible ways to resolve those conflicts in your application. You can do things like two different versions of a shopping cart and they both add something. You're just going to stick them both in there and merge that incoherency in a, in a application specific way. Um, it has a, a simple key value data model, um, generally targeted towards small objects, I think. Although you can store like JSON structured data in the value and it'll generate secondary indexes. So you can do things like map reduce queries across it um, within some constraints. So there's that. And then sort of moving up in terms of complexity, there's Cassandra, which is also an AP system, but it has a much, a much more complicated data model. So it looks a lot more like a database. You have rows and columns. You have this extra time dimension. Um, and it also has secondary indexes, so you can do these sort of SQL-like queries across the data that's stored, stored in Cassandra. Um, so sort of wrapping all, everything up in conclusion, I think that the main point um, is that usually the first thing um, that people reach for, at least people of my generation reach for when they're building a, a scalable storage application is a file system. Um, but file systems are typically poor matches for scale-out applications. So usually, uh, depending on how you're doing it, you're going to have to deal with all the sort of ad hoc sharding to make sure that you're distributed across lots of servers. Um, and it's sort of annoying to reinvent the wheel. Um, the file abstraction is often overly simple for the kind of data that you're really going to store. And at the same time, the other complexity that file systems offer in terms of um, directories and renames and so forth aren't really important or useful for most scale-out applications where you're just you know, shoveling image data into a storage system. Um, on the flip side, um, something like Libratos gives you transparent scaling replication. Um, very soon we'll have erasure coding, which is also very exciting. Um, you have a richer object data model, so you can store bytes and objects, attributes on this key value data. Um, you have it's a rich API with these sort of transaction things, snapshots, watch notify. Um, and most interestingly, I think you can extend that functionality using this class mechanism that lets you sort of push your own code into the storage layer. Um, so you can, you can push as much of the computation in your distributed system to the actual storage nodes close to the data um, and use that as a, as a fundamental building block for your system. Uh, so that's it. Um, I have a couple of URLs here. Um, naturally, the best reference for, for coding to a new API is to look at the header file that defines the interface. Um, in our case, we have Doxygen comments um, for most of the methods. Um, the, C++, the C1 is very well documented. The C++ one is slightly less documented. Um, in most cases, we generate the web pages for that. Um, you can go to the Ceph docs and you can find those links. And of course, there's the development email list and people on IRC are very excited to see people using Libratus, so um, they'd be very eager to help. So, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> If anyone has some questions, we've got about eight minutes to... Yeah. Uh, Florian. Uh, can you summarize the current state of the Libratos interfaces for languages for real world? Like, um, like Python. Yes. Yeah, so the... Um, if you look at all the languages, the C++ one is the most expansive. Um, it's the one that has support for all these transactions um, and so forth, because that's the one that we use internally for Rados Gateway and RBD. Um, the Python bindings are after the C bindings, the Python bindings are probably the most complete. Um, they're used by, um, some, there's some RBD wrapper libraries and libRBD and so forth that are used by OpenStack and some other things. Um, there isn't support for the, the transactions yet in that interface, although it'd be pretty straightforward to add. It's just, we're sort of waiting for a user to ask for it and they'll do it. Um, the Erlang bindings, I think, are pretty complete. They're um, sites in production. We have customers that are building Dropbox things and they're using Erlang. Um, I don't know what state the PHP ones are in. Um, yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah? Cool. So you said there's some Haskell ones, too. Yeah. That's very, very exciting. That's curious. Dropbox is actually within Python. What's that? Oh, you were saying about building Dropbox things, and I was saying Dropbox itself is built in Python. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes? About the cost control sync functions on the OSP. So what's the execution context? It is... Um, you have to implement it in C. So the question is, what's the execution context for the classes that you implement that are run on the storage nodes? Um, so you, it's written, you have to write your code to a C API, um, and those, those functions are invoked directly in the I.O. path. So instead of calling into an internal function that's doing a write or something like that, it's calling directly into your code. And your code can, can call out to Rados methods to actually do reads and to append things to the currently accumulating transaction. Um, or can do whatever processing it needs. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's yeah. So you can mess things up. Yeah. So you're running you're running in the same context as the, the source server. So you don't want to deploy bad code. Um, if you're worried about um, 
you know, sandboxing things more tightly, then you could write a class that implements a sandbox and then runs something in a sandbox. For example, in a Lua script or something like that. Um, yeah, the question is whether the execution overhead is minimal, and yes, exactly. That's, that's the reason it's done that way. Just yes. to extend that question, are there, you said you have to implement sandboxing yourself, but are there any restrictions on how much memory that process could use, or if you run away, it'll just take the whole thing? Uh, yeah, the question is if there are restrictions on how much memory you can use um, if you're doing your own sandbox. Um, I mean, currently, there are no restrictions. So if you want to use a lot of memory, that's fine. Your, your OSD process will just get really big, and hopefully your host has enough memory to deal with that. If not, it'll crash or something. Um, so I think, I think if you need an additional level of protection, then you can build in whatever sandbox you want. Um, so originally when we were designing this, we, we um, were considering just building a, a Python interpreter in and actually using that as a sandbox. Um, but in the end, um, it seemed useful to be able to also implement native methods that run um, with higher priority. And you can always implement that sandbox as a class to sort of layer it, layer it in, which is exactly what happened with the, the Lua stuff. Yes. It sounds like the operation stuff you were describing supersedes this, but the question I have is if I've got an IO context and I'm holding a lock on an object and something else comes along and breaks that lock, is there is there some way I can find out about that? Like why will the next operation fail mm -hmm. or what's the behavior? So the, the question is what happens if you have a lock on an object? Um, and you're on an IO context and if it gets interrupted. The short answer is there is no, there is no locking. So the, the, the requests that are generated by the client and sent to the cluster are sort of discrete requests that um, execute atomically um, in isolation. Um, so there's no sort of stateful lock that you can take. Um, that said, there is a Rados class called lock that implements a cooperative locking scheme. Um, so what does Rados underscore lock do? Uh, so the, the class underscore lock? Is that what you're? Sorry? Um, yes, so there is, in the CA API, there's a Rados lock, and that is actually, those are just wrappers around calling the lock class. So it's, it's purely cooperative locking. So it's similar to POSIX locks, um, where the, the system will keep track of who holds locks, and you can break them by just removing their entry. But it's totally cooperative, so they only enforce anything if you actually check to see if you hold a lock or not. Um, so just to sort of clarify, what the way that's usually used is with the, the block device, for example. You can, you can take a lock on a device, um, and then you use it, and if somebody else comes along and they want to lock it, they'll try to take the lock, they'll fail, they'll um, break your lock and um, blacklist your identifier, your sort of your cluster ID, and so you will no longer be able to talk to the cluster, so they'll fence you out, and then they'll break your lock and then take over. The transaction stuff, what, what releases that method? Does it still work progress? What releases? The transaction stuff, is that now out there? Yes, yeah, so the question is whether the transaction stuff is there, and that's, yes. Yeah, so that's used extensively by the Rados gateway and the Rados block device. Yeah? Does that mean that there's no blocking then for any of the requests you do? If you're reading and something else is simultaneously trying to write to it, um, you're not going to block the rest of the line right. issues? Yeah, so the question is whether there's blocking if you have simultaneous read and write requests. Uh, the short answer is that that's, it's essentially serialized at the server side. So the requests will come in, they'll get in a queue, the read will happen, and then the write will happen, or vice versa. So there's, there's sort of an implicit ordering. So right. right. It, could be that, it could be that you send a request and it takes a long time because the cluster is busy doing another operation in front of it that's slow. Or maybe there's some recovery going on and it has to get, fetch the right copy of that object or something like that. Um, but in general, there's no sort of, there's no statefulness in the request that you're doing. So unlike a, a traditional file handle or something, um, it's sort of an atomic, atomic unit of operation. Yes? Have you guys done any real-world comparisons of NFS performance versus CFS if it's access over the network? Uh, yeah, the question is whether we've done real-world comparisons of NFS and CFS. I'm in what the overhead is if there is any. So can I ask the same question against a real file system like Lustre or something? <laughs> <laughs> um, the short answer is we haven't done any performance comparisons on CFS <laughs> recently. So most of the performance testing I did was um, back when I was working actively on CephFS specifically. Um, and that was mostly around making sure that the metadata paths were optimized so that um, you wouldn't actually wait for disk I.O. when you're doing things like file creations. Um, so I don't, I don't have any sort of good numbers. I think the, generally it's just going to depend on how fast your, your Rados nodes are. So on the client side, generally you can saturate the network interface. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's shipping the pages directly to the, the Ethernet or whatever the 
network stack without copying them and so forth. So it's really just the speed of your network interface that's limiting you on the client side. On the server side, it's just how, how fast your disks are, the fact that it has to replicate it on multiple servers, so and there's some more processing overhead. It's writing it into a file system, and so there's, there's some overhead there. So there, it'll, it'll slow down, but so the fact that there's no... Um, right. So the question is whether the, the translation from the POSIX file interface to the object interface is, is significant. And I think no, particularly on the, on the server side. So all that's really happening is when you do a, a POSIX write, it's going directly into the page cache. When it does write back, those pages are being um, passed to the Ceph driver. It's calculating the striping and just mapping those pages to a particular object. And it's just shipping them over the network to some storage server. And then the storage server is handling the details of replicating it across multiple nodes. Mm -hmm. Last question. Yes. Um, how does it handle latency? Like your consistency, consistency model, would that stop it being used from, say, between countries? Uh, yeah, so the question is what do we do for um, multiple regions, um, high latency links, um, running a single cluster across multiple countries? Um, so we generally don't do anything special for that. So the a main feature or whatever property of Rados is that all writes are synchronous. So it'll write to all replicas of the object. Once all the acknowledgments are gathered, then you reply back to the client. So you can spread a cluster across um, a wide geography or in very slow links. Um, and it just means that those writes are gonna be really slow. Um, and if you can tolerate that and you don't care, that's fine. Um, and if you can't, then that's not a good idea. Um, that said, there are lots of users that um, distribute Ceph clusters across multiple data centers in um, I guess small countries, um, for example, typical European countries have only a few milliseconds to get from one border to the other, and so they can actually just distribute the cluster around the country, and that those those latency levels are acceptable for those particular use cases. Sorry, uh, to add to that question is uh, what about network splits? Uh, the question is what about network splits? Um, so Ceph is designed to to deal with that gracefully. So there are. Um, a collection of nodes, a subset of the cluster that are called monitors that run Paxos essentially. Um, and so there's majority of voting essentially. And so whichever part of the cluster you happen to be in that can access the majority of those monitors is the one that has the consistent view and can continue reading and writing. And then the other people who are on the, the smaller partition um, can't do anything. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly where the, the AP versus CP thing comes in. Um, other types of systems in a partition event let you write to both replicas, and then they resolve that conflict later. In Ceph's case, um, the types of applications that we want to support, like block devices and file systems, we need sort of strict consistency and coherency, and so we don't allow it. Great. All right, so All right. thank you very much. Uh, as thank a you.